All right, we are officially recorded, so welcome to the event. Thanks to Ron for joining us. We're going to talk about cultures of thinking in action, 10 mindsets to transform our teaching and students' learning. There it is, the book in, in its uh, entirety. Uh, so thanks all for joining. Like I said, there'll probably be some that will join in as well. Um, my guess is uh, you know Ron. Oh, there's a, there's somebody coming in that you know Ron, and we'll give him a chance to, to say hello and introduce our, himself as well. But why don't we go around the horn here? Um, we can start with Richard. I know you said you're in Toronto, but tell us a little bit more about what you do and um, anything that you think is important in terms of your educational, uh, I guess, background and why you're here. What I do is play pickleball. So that's you know, that's my introduction. Uh, my educational background, I worked in a uh, private school in Toronto for 25 years or so. Uh, I've worked a lot with the IB now. I do a lot of consulting with them for approaches to teaching and learning and social emotional learning, which I put together and call relational teaching and learning. I think that's the core of any kind of teaching and learning is relational. So. That's what I do with that. Um, I also do some leadership work with the IB. Uh, I like the IB, I like its value system. It's not perfect, but they have made some really great strides with uh, DEI and, and J. Uh, so, and I'm currently working on a project where they're trying to make language and literature, which is one of their new courses, uh, a course for the delivery of diversity, equity, and inclusion, particularly for marginalized learners. So. Uh, that's kind of what's turning my crank right now. Interesting. I'd not heard DEI with the J until I, I don't think I had. I actually did some work with a school in Germany, and one of the teachers just reached out to me today, and he's doing DEI J work in Germany. So I don't know if that's a, a non-American. Must be a non-American uh, addition to the DEI acronym. So yeah, it's it's justice. It's a foreign concept to America. I think. <laughs> 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 sorry, sorry. <laughs> that's a different. That's a different uh, hangout. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, James, uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, give give some of the same kind of background, that kind of thing. Sure. Well, actually, back when when DEIJ was being tossed around, there was some who were proposing it be J E D I, so Jedi. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but anyway, the, and there's also obviously D E I B. Um, I work I, 25 years, similar to Richard, in education, worked as an IB economics teacher for 18 of those years, and then was lulled over to the dark side as an administrator for seven of those years, um, and then and then now work as a consultant with uh, Will Richardson and Homa Talangar in Big Questions Institute. Um, and then I also do some work with Amala Education, uh, working with teachers in refugee camps in Kenya and Amman, Jordan, who are mainly new to service or refugees themselves who don't have a lot of pedagogical background and training to teach in the refugee camp. So I do weekly or biweekly, uh, basically like pedagogy 101 sessions with, with them. And, uh, and I'm writing a book on uh, standards-based grading and assessment reform. And I started a tour company here in Monterrey, Mexico, where I live uh, on the battle, uh, walking tour of the battle of Monterrey, uh, which was a, the first urban warfare battle in history. So, so you're welcome. Anytime you come to Monterey, uh, anybody in this call gets a free tour. <laughs> All right, great. Well, thanks. Susanna, how about you? She's in Bermuda, but what else? Yes, I'm in Bermuda. I'm the co-author of a book called Flexible Mindsets in Schools, uh, Channeling Brain Power for Critical Thinking, Complex Problem Solving, and Creativity. So I am a student success consultant and trainer spreading the word about flexible mindsets, um, ideally training teachers in schools, whole schools, to build flexible mindsets. Um, and uh, interesting to hear both of you, James and Richard, talking about IB. I I work as also an executive function coach here in Bermuda with high school and college students. Well, they're all around the world, but we do IB here in Bermuda as well. Quite a lot of students that I'm working with are doing IB and the school, I'm doing a whole school building flexible mindsets with them and they're an IB school. And we started with building relationships as the foundation mm -hmm. using approaches to learning. And I think I would, I feel like I could pick your brain, Richard, because they're, they're really struggling and mm -hmm. it, it, I really wish it wasn't such a, to me, it seems like the, a very 
basic foundation being all relationship based and yet they're they're really piecemealing it and not seeing how it it is just the foundation of learning. Mm -hmm. I loved when you said that it was just relational learning that that is exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, thanks. And Gretchen, how about you? Hi everyone. Well, I am a classroom teacher turned academic coach turned now the founder of a community for educators I call the Anti-Boring Learning Lab. And my passion is actually around neuroscience and, and cognitive sci and what we know about how to learn based on science. And it drives me a little crazy that teachers who do want to know how brains work will learn that, but nobody seems to think that kids need to know how their brains work. Mm -hmm. And I am really passionate about, I seem to work mostly with uh, educators in what I call the quirky corners of education. So that's a mm -hmm. lot of special ed teachers, a lot of other academic or, you know, the, the world of ADHD and executive function coaching is really growing right now and independent study schools, those sorts of people. But I, I, I teach a toolkit that I call the anti-boring toolkit to help students be able to make better learning choices for themselves. So I'm really interested in any structures like the one we're going to learn more about today, about how to make learning more visible, not just to the educators, but to the students who are actually doing the learning. Hmm. And did you say, I'm sorry if I missed it, where you're joining us from? I did not say. I'm in Oakland, California. Okay. All right. So not And I'll also, oh, sorry, go ahead. I said non the only non-international one here, right? I guess so. <laughs> well, besides me. Well, yeah. Ron, I think, is in the United States again, but he just got back yeah. from Australia. So <laughs> And because we're such a small group and we brought up the relational word, I will just say that at some point I'm going to need to turn my camera off so that I can drive. So when I do that, I'm still very connected and relating, just not with my face. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thanks. Okay, well, um, again, uh, appreciate y'all being here. You know, the intent is to of the community and, and these is just to give an opportunity to have more complex and nuanced conversations and learn. And um, this one being a little smaller is great because we get to maybe have a little bit different kinds of conversation. I certainly don't want to dominate the conversation and do it like I would a podcast, but I'll start off by uh, giving Ron the floor a little bit and maybe to, you know, explain like what you think, like when you think of cultures of things like what's the definition and, and sort of uh, elevator pitch, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, I mean, so the, the cultures of thinking were, grow, grew out of the research that I did in classrooms, really studying how teachers who were really adept at getting students to think how those teachers went about that. And, and what I noticed was you know, the key was really building a culture. And again, you know, everyone's kind of mentioned the importance of relationships and we all kind of recognize that relationships are a core kind of um, aspect of culture. Of course, there are other um, things around that as well, but that is certainly very, very central. And I identified in that um, kind of eight cultural forces, the interactions um, is one of those, but things like the um, the environment, the physical environment that we create, the language that we use, um, the routines and structures we put in place, um, the opportunities we create, the way we allocate time. So th these are really the building blocks of culture and been working with um, teachers and continue to do research on this for, for several decades seeing great progress some places, um, seeing um, less great progress other places. And one of the things that then I became very interested in was, well, what is it that causes some teachers and um, in some places to really make this terrific progress um, and others not? And it was that the mindsets that these teachers had. And so I began to then really uncover, well, what are the mindsets that are really the key um, to unlocking the creation of that, that culture of thinking? Um, in terms of kind of definitionally, we define a culture of thinking as a place. So not limited to a school or classroom. Um, anytime a group of people come together, like we are doing right now, we have the opportunity to create a culture of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, one group of educators that I work with are museum educators. Um, mm -hmm. And museum educators would see their students typically only once. 
and generally only for you know 60 to 90 minutes and they can, still can create that that culture um within that short amount of time so the culture thinking are places in which the groups um collective as well as individual thinking it's valued it's visible and it's actively promoted as part of the regular day-to-day -day experience of all group members so that is what we are striving for that is what we are trying to create when we talk about a culture of thinking yeah thanks and and like i said i don't want to dominate so feel free to to chime in here or there but um and, and interrupt me and tell me to stop talking but i'm i'm curious one of the things that as you're talking about that and as i'm thinking about it and and what one of the things that i talk a lot about is the sort of value of intellectual nourishment and the ways in which we hold each other accountable for you know doing real thinking in our professional settings and i'm curious how you've seen that interact if 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 in fact you there's anything meaningful to note in terms of um yeah so i guess that dirty word of evaluation right which usually is not a very good um or productive uh exercise in most schools but it seems to me like there's we're really missing the boat on uh that i that seems to me it would be very connected to to a culture of thinking and and being able to really leverage the thinking of others and learn from one another and those kinds of things so i'm curious i don't think we talked about this in our podcast anything that's sort of related to the evaluation procedures um, I wouldn't say it's, you know, I mean, the the connection that I'm making there isn't so much to do with um, evaluation, but the um, what we call mindset number one here is that the idea that if we want to create a culture of thinking for students, we have to create schools which are cultures of thinking for the teachers mm -hmm. as well. And so that brings in that kind of community um, sense. And um, I think about the way that I think about the issue of, of accountability professionally is not accountability in terms of scores or evaluation right. or sort of checking up on you, but being professionally accountable to one another so that when, you know, we're um, engaged in inquiry together professionally, you know, we are in fact doing that. So we are learning from one another, mm -hmm. going into one another's classrooms. And that um, kind of collegiality that pushes one another is what I find is the strongest kind of accountability that we need. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, like I said, feel free if anybody has comments or questions that you want to add on. Um, I'll pause here and, and jump in, please. James. Yeah, James. Yeah. So, um, so when you just mentioned that, Ron, about going into others' classrooms. I, I worked in two different schools where I was a principal. I, I implemented instructional rounds um, for teachers to go and do that exact de-siloing the classroom. Mm -hmm. Do you have, yeah. did you find any connections with that as a practice in, as a formalized practice to get teachers to go into other people's rooms and use teachers as model teachers rather than evaluation? Yeah, um, I mean, I'm, you know, instructional rounds can be, um, you know, uh, Richard Elmore's work there can be very valuable. We've done some of that around cultures of thinking. Um, even that, I, so I think that, that that is another kind of that accountability. You are, you've got your critical friends there who are um, kind of really looking, you know, at, at your, your practice there. What we have looked at, and one of the the tools that um, you know I, I share in the book is what we call snapshot observations. And what I have found, and, and what this grew out of, and perhaps all of you have, um, or some of you anyway, have, have had this experience is, you know, when you talk about getting into one another's classrooms and observing, most teachers are really open to that. They they like the mm -hmm. idea. They like the idea of visiting one another. And then the sheer logistics of it, of setting it up, means it doesn't happen. You know, um, I will suggest that, say, at the beginning of the year when I'm working with a school and come back, you know, four months later and ask about it. And they'll say, oh, no, we still haven't gotten to it. You know, and it's just the logistics. So this, so the protocol that we designed was called the snapshot observation protocol, which only takes 10 minutes. Um, and the focus of the observation is for the observers. 
It's not for the people being observed. And most of the time that we have structured observations in classrooms, in schools, we have kind of had a default mindset of, well, these outsiders are here to give me feedback. They're here to share information with me. They're here to coach me, they're here to do this, which is totally legitimate and totally a, a real thing, but it's not the only reason to observe. You can say, um, we're observing for us, the observers. It, and it's for, you know, it's for me. And so in this 10 minute snapshot observation, a, a group of teachers, and they only need to be free the same period. Um, there doesn't need to be release time. There doesn't need to be a pre-conference. They go in for 10 minutes. Um, and the, the nice thing um, about culture is you can go in and see 10 minutes of culture. Um, if you're focused on a lesson, you have to see the whole lesson. You have to be there the whole period to understand the lesson. And that, again, makes a, a structure for the observation, which can be quite onerous. So when we focus on culture and we go in, oh, I'm going to go in for 10 minutes, then we come back um, and take notes on what we, we saw. But then we use all that observation um, not to evaluate, not to criticize, not to give feedback, but to use whatever we saw as kind of a mirror to reflect on ourselves. So we may have seen, you know, something that was great happening, but say, ah, you know, that was a science classroom and I teach history. How would that work, you know, in my classroom? We may have seen something problematic and instead of just saying, ah, you know, that teacher's not very good, we say, ah, I wonder if I do that. Does that ever happen? And ah, how might I do with it? So we want, we encourage these reflective conversations. And so what we found is because this is simple and easy to do, doesn't require a lot of logistics, it's more likely to happen. Um, and teachers will go into that. And it does have the benefit of teachers realize, ah, I now know more about what's happening in my colleagues' classrooms. There's more camaraderie. I, in these reflective conversations, I've also made myself vulnerable because I have said, yeah, I, I struggle with that as well. I, I, you know, yeah, the, the teacher called on the same three or four students and yeah, that's a real problem for me. I find I do that a lot. How can we not do that? Um, so the, the conversations go to kind of the heart of teaching and I found that to be a, a really kind of useful thing. So, um, you know, the, the, the instructional rounds, I mean, a great program, again, that Richard Elmore did. I, I did find it, it is a big structure that you're working with. There's a lot of moving parts to make instructional rounds work. You need a lot of players. You need a lot of release time um, to kind of do that. So it certainly ha has, it has its value. And at the other end, the snapshot observation kind of fitting in in a much smaller kind of context. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, we actually did just to follow up. We we yeah. we didn't have the the infrastructure that we needed because we just did it during teachers' um, prep periods. Okay. So there, there wasn't release time necessary, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and the only and we did twenty five minutes instead of ten. Okay. But it was it was just enough time to get in there, and the teacher, the, the observed teacher, told us told the groups when to come in. Yeah. It's like come at the beginning of class, come at the end of class. This is when we're gonna see. Like I always do a quiz at the beginning, so it's boring. Uh, but it was yeah, it, it doesn't require the infrastructure. You can yeah. do it during okay, great. Great. Um, Richard, you were gonna say something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, where to start? Uh, so my question on this is uh, and James, you just said it that people gave teachers gave up their uh, prep time to do this. And we're always asking teachers to give up something to think. To, to do something that we think is important. And I wonder if we just invert that question and ask teachers, what do you think is is important and how can we resource what, what you need? Um, yeah, uh, you know, my experience in, in, I worked at a school for many, many years and passive resistance is a wonderful quality of teachers and I, I majored in it. And so every, you know, every year we'd go back and I was in admin the last five years, but, um, uh, every year we'd go back and admin would, would come up with a whole new thing for us to do that year. And whether it was, uh, it, it doesn't matter what it was. Uh, and then most of us learned that if we just went on doing what we knew was good to do, it would pass. Mm -hmm. And then there'd be something new the next year. Mm -hmm. But nobody ever asked us if we were planning what the year's PD goal should be. They always, you know, so that's my question. Sorry to be so roundabout about it, but um, 
the experts are in the classrooms, aren't they? Well, I, and it, I mean, that's certainly a part of this mindset, number one, and creating that culture of thinking for teachers is how do we bring in their their voices? How do we bring in their interest? How do we, um, you know, kind of um, co-design the professional learning, you know, with teachers so that they do feel that they have a voice? No one likes to feel like, you know, they've been, um, you know, done to <laughs> that they're just, you know, kind of putting through somebody else's uh, mm -hmm. paces there. So it is really important about creating that that culture, um, you know, to do that. You know, at, at the same time, I do think there's a place for the idea of, um, you know, sometimes people need to experience some structures and things to see what's possible. Um, and that that opens you know, the avenue uh, of the doors. I know the uh, school district that I work with um, in Southern California right now, as, you know, I've, we're in, I think, our sixth year there. And, you know, as we got into these ideas and people were kind of more knowledgeable about them, they did hand over more control to the teachers. Uh, and, um, you know, being an entire district, not saying uh, we, we all need to be doing exactly the same thing. We've got this common goal, but mm -hmm. how can you know we create these structures which are going to serve you um, best and begin to kind of bring in their their voices and their direction, you know? And of course, very well received because teachers feel like oh, I, I've chosen this opportunity because it fits for me, mm -hmm. um, and it's really a valuable thing. So yes, I be believe that's a, a very big piece of creating that culture of thinking for um teachers is how do you um you know bring them in and at, at the same time there's has to be i think that um that push there as well because on one hand some groups of teachers could say just give me more planning time that's all i want mm -hmm. more planning time and 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 they continue to be siloed and they you know just do that and i think we we put out there you know you know our, our goal is to grow professionally to grow as a community um to push ourselves to challenge we need those things happening and that that's our goal and yes once we accept that then how um what are your ideas about how we might might accomplish that mm -hmm. um susanna gretchen anything you want to add to that Feel free to unmute and just talk. <laughs> I have a thought that's uh, that's it's not quite a question yet, but it's chewing in the back of my brain. <laughs> um, I had a conversation with a principal the other day at one of these. So I'm in California and California has a thriving independent study. They're public schools, but they're independent study to serve either marginalized learners or the acting community in LA who, who can't go to regular schools. And this particular principal was reflecting like what she really wants her teachers to be able to do differently is to see the reality of the kinds of language they use with students and how actually uncaring it is. And to start practicing transforming to a culture of care. I think that was her language. And one of the things we talked about was how um, teachers also tend to do with students what administrators tend to do with teachers. And so, I don't know that there's a question here exactly, but I see you nodding your head or if any of you have thoughts <laughs> about about this um, issue, because this, this principal was reaching out to me to find out what kind of a training could I do. And I certainly have tools that I can share, but I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on this issue. Hmm. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I, I, could, I have some thoughts for sure, but <laughs> feel free if anybody wants to jump in. Well, I'll, I'll jump in and I, I won't be long, but uh, in most of the consulting I do, especially in the in the IB diploma program, the, the central tension of that program is the quality, Gretchen, of the classroom experience on one hand and the high stakes assessment on the other. And students, parents, you know, the, the most common question of students ask in, in class in the IB often is just tell me what to do so I can do well on the exam because my parents are put, you know, blah, blah. So there, there's that incredible tension. And I, I think, Ron, to your point about teacher change and building momentum for um, thoughtful practice that meets students' needs, um, when the needs are completely aligned with assessment, it's very hard to say, yeah, you know what, but 
things like civility or things like knowing how to listen or things that are going to be lifelong skills they're actually more important but you can't preach about that so in terms of your culture thing i i think i mean and i could be totally wrong here but i think that what what teachers need is the courage to operationalize their beliefs about what it means to learn as human beings mm -hmm. and bring that into the classroom and say it doesn't matter what you do in physics it doesn't matter what you do in english in this room these are the protocols these are the agreements that we're going to have about what it means to be a learning community in this room that's okay. Well, and um, just to piggyback on what you're saying there, Richard, I would also, you know, kind of add that, um, you know, sometimes there's kind of this false dichotomy that if either we do this or this, that actually learners thrive in that that kind of context, they actually do better. You know, there's more collaboration and more support kind of for the learning. Um, you know, so th this, you know conversation and what you raised there, Gretchen, connects to uh, to mindset four, which is that the students learn best when they feel valued, known, and respected mm -hmm. by both the adults as well as uh, as their their peers. And you know, you talked about um, you know the administrator there wanting wanting the teachers to see um kind of their um their language. Um and my experience around language, language is a cultural force. I've done a lot around that. Um, it certainly connects here um, to this this mindset for what I have found moves people forward is is greater awareness um, that it can be very confronting, um, like to go into your colleagues and say, ah, oh, you know, you did this into that. So using videos, people looking at that, people noticing those small things and beginning to do that. Once they um, become aware, then they can become more sensitive to that they can become more sensitive to that kind of in their their own practice and then um you know it can be useful to get some feedback on that but it needs to also come from a very trusted source so mm -hmm. it, we allow teachers or encourage teachers to say um form a triad rather than just a pair but form a triad in which you will go into one another's classrooms you'll kind of give them feedback but it's with their own kind of trusted um colleagues and then the other connection I would I would make there, um, the and I I don't remember the the source of this, but I wrote about it in the book um, around microaggressions, and you know we all know like uh, mm -hmm. you you shouldn't do that, and <laughs> um, what the researcher said like it's not enough to tell people not to engage in microaggressions, you actually need to give them something to do to replace that. And what you do is micro affirmations. And so getting used to, ah, uh, you know, how do I affirm the learners in my classroom? How do I take those small moments to affirm them as people? Mm -hmm. So it's not just good work, well done. You know, I like what, what you did, mm -hmm. you know, pleasing me as a teacher, but those micro affirmations in terms of, you know, I, I see you, I know what you bring to the classroom. You're a part of the conversation. I'm glad you're here. Those small moments and getting in the habit of micro affirmations helps to squeeze out those microaggressions which people might be in, engaging in. Hmm. That's interesting. And do you think teaching microaffirmations without naming the microaggression piece, like just let's do microaffirmations, period, or is it important to name it, name both of them? I think them? it is important. I think, you know, and so I think that, you know, that because you know, when you move to something, it, it's rather than removing something negative, think about what what positive things you want mm -hmm. in there and using that as the squeeze out. But it is, I would say, yes, it's important to recognize, uh, you know, the thing about microaggressions is they um, often, um, you know, are, are not in the moment intentional. Um, they do have, you know, deep, deep seated things in terms of where they might kind of come from in terms of us, um, but that we aren't always aware of them. They kind of slip out. They may, you know, we may engage in more of that when we feel pressure, um, which we do as teachers and we have that. So that acknowledgement of this is something that, you know, we as humans engage in without saying mm -hmm. this is a problem at this school you know i think mm -hmm. naming it as a human problem and owning it and then saying uh you know 
here here's what we want to do to to replace that so yeah i would definitely still name the problem but not have it be named as you know you all are problematic here you're engaging your mm -hmm. way too much of this that brings me uh, it reminds me when you know ron you talk about the mindset four of the you know the importance of students feeling valued and of course it's obvious that the same thing applies to teachers and and their leadership right which to me strikes me as a, a fundamental question here i mean i remember when i left the classroom in 2012 i was so burned out and you know certainly wasn't a culture of thinking it wasn't a culture it wasn't a good culture right um and so i i talk with so many teachers um and and hear from teachers who are in schools where they don't feel valued by their leadership the the leadership is you know maybe struggling to get by they don't have the skills they've got uh, you know a, a very difficult population perhaps that you know makes all of those challenges make you know, all of those things that we're all probably very familiar with and you say well you know what does it look like what would it look like you know for you as an individual teacher to make this a really great place to work and you know that culture of thinking to me sort of comes to mind right that intellectual nourishment but you can't create that on your own right so i'm curious you know from anybody um and ron especially you if you know like what do you what, what advice do you give to a teacher that's that's really wanting to engage in this kind of uh, a mindset these kinds of mindsets but you know the chaos around them are like oh yeah sure just uh we'll just do culture of thinking here right and I, you know that kind of thing i'm so i'm curious anybody's thoughts on that that sort of challenge and that tension Well, I think, you know, I mean, as, as you are mentioning there, there, Drew, of course, there is, you know, great power when we can create that community, when a whole school's on board, then people feel like, oh, I'm a, I'm a part of something that is something that, that most people um, want. Um, my biggest kind of, you know, connection to what you're saying is for, for years, I was involved in um, in a research project around um, creativity and innovation in teaching that was um, sponsored by Disney. It was part of Disney's American Teacher Awards when they did that. So, you know, we were identifying, you know, a teacher from um, you know, every state, um, you know, and, and looking at this. And we had, I think, around 10,000 applicants every year. And so, you know, these and a common denominator that I found year after year is that, you know, there are great teachers doing amazing things and they are in places where they do not necessarily have the support of, you know, the administration or their principal, um, but they still managed to do that. And what what we found was um, they would find someone. <laughs> You know, it might be just someone else at the school that they do, but sometimes, it, you know, uh, people, if it wasn't someone at the school, they would find a teaching colleague at another school or across the country or any place else. They would find someone who nourished. So people recognize that importance of that nourishment and they will seek it out and find someone who um, is on the same wavelength who wants to grow as a teacher and grow professionally and they use that as as their touchstone so as a last resort if you don't have that if you don't have that support you know you do need to look elsewhere yeah james i was going to say one is that one of the greatest powers that teachers have is that they do get to go into their classroom and close the door and work with their creative community now there's all kinds of external influences that come in and there's there's all kinds of obstacles to that, but but you do have the opportunity to say, I'm gonna create this culture in my classroom or classrooms, right? mm -hmm. multiple classes, and then maybe finding other colleagues to do it. But the point, the reason why I raised my hand, uh, Ron, is when you mentioned the, the idea of finding a, a person to nurse you, I didn't, I never thought of that as a concept until I entered administration and and mm -hmm. thought of it as a as a principal needing to find, because all of a sudden you become you have your own separate siloing, right? You obviously become apart from your staff, right? Because there's that supervisory role, and there's there's the aspect of of um, people, whether I wanted to or not, people would view me differently because of my role. And so, getting permission and being told as an administrator that I needed to seek out mentors, as especially as a new administrator, um, even though I was 18 years into the job, like I was a new administrator, being told. You need to seek out mentors and it's okay to seek out mentors 
flipping that when I then realized, oh my gosh, I never thought of this as a teacher. Like nobody ever said to me, I need to find a mentor. Um, Cause I started teaching in the mid nineties. And so you weren't still, you weren't thinking along those lines yet. Right. And then giving teachers permission to say, you know what, you don't have to do it on your own. Like you don't have to struggle against whatever you're struggling on your own and allowing them to go find mentors and find communities and opening up those options of places like this community or other areas where they can go and get that, that nourishment. But I think a lot of teachers, and I, I've experienced this both on as a teacher and as an administrator, feel like that they're failing at their job if they ask for help or if they ask for, for uh, assistance or mentoring because it's seen as like you're supposed to be the professional and the expert on everything. And if you need mentoring, it clearly means that you're not doing a good job. Um, and we need to break that cycle because I think that teachers are burning out. Well, I know that we all know teachers are burning out left and right. And if we were creating this culture where it's okay for teachers to ask for help or for mentoring assistance within their own building, outside the community, wherever it happens to be that they're getting it, um, I think that is one of the greatest gifts we could give to educators is that assistance, that allow them to ask for the assistance. Hmm. Yeah, that reminds me, you know, you, you talk about the the sort of stigma or perception. Um, and it, I think you're right, James, that people do have that sort of insecurity or that vulnerability. And it's, it's scary to ask for that. But then if we reframe it and in terms of that intellectual nourishment, right? And and it reminds me of, you know, again, when I was at the end of my 15 years in the classroom, and it's not that I wanted to leave the classroom, but I was just really burned out. One of the things that I did um, was to, uh, I, there was a, a guy who was an English teacher who then became an academic coach. And I didn't really know him. I'd seen him in the building and the, you know, talk about poor culture. I could be in the same building as this guy and not, not really ever know anything about him. Uh, but I remember at the beginning of the, the year, he, uh, one of my last years, he spoke to the, to the, you know, the staff in the, you know, opening meeting and said, you know, I'm an academic coach and all those introduced himself and his role and that kind of thing. And I could tell, you know, this is a smart guy. This is, really, you know, and so I caught him in the hallways. His name is Fox. And I said, Fox, will you, can you add me to your roster? Right? Like I, I didn't feel like I needed help or, you know, that I was in, you know, struggling as a teacher, but just the ability and, and the opportunity to have those adult intellectual conversations that to me, it just, you know, it's really synonymous in many ways or analogous with this culture of thinking kind of mindset, right? These mindsets of how do you seek those out and value them and reframe them mm -hmm. as conversations that are uh, that are so valuable. And, you, you know, you don't have to be struggling as a teacher to, to, to get those, to have those, that kind of thing. So anyways, I just thought I'd add that. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, you know, often say to, to groups that I work with is, you know, um, learning is complex. <laughs> you know, the, the more we know about neuroscience, the more we know about learning. Learning is complex. If we accept that, that learning is complex, why would we not also accept that teaching is complex? <laughs> Um, you know, you've got now 25, 30 minds together. You've, you, you know, you have you know, exponentially grow in the complexity there. And I think when we understand and when we accept learning is complex, thus teaching is complex, that gives us a lot of permission not to be perfect, to recognize there are always going to be struggles. There are always going to be things we can do better. And to me, that really kind of opens the door to, it's not about, oh, I'm not a good teacher, I'm not struggling. It's not, nah, you know, I'm trying to reach this student. I, you know, I'm trying to present this and, and, and do it in a more engaging and more connected way that we've always got these, these natural challenges. Um, and again, I think we see again, that same mirroring that when we kind of recognize, ah, uh, here are all the things I'm trying to do, you know, in, in the classroom. And I wouldn't expect my uh, learners to, you know, think that learning is just this, you know, snap your fingers and you either get it or you don't. Why would we expect the same thing, you know, there, you know, for, for teachers as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. having the same mirroring. Yeah, for sure. Well, one thing that I wanted to ask and, and, and get out on the table 
because you talk about learning and teaching being complex, and I, I certainly agree. There's no doubt about that. You know, I, if anybody pays attention to to the work that I do and some of the interactions I have in social media, I'm in the feel like this existential battle with these science of learning people and you know everything being measurable, right? Which feels like, I mean, they wouldn't say that learning is not complex, but it feels like everything to them is a simple, right? Yeah, but- <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and one of the interactions that I had recently was, you know, I value inquiry really, really highly, right? And cultures of thinking, and we use making meaning routine. And, you know, I, I count that as a, uh, okay, thanks, Gretchen. Um, she's, she's about to start driving. Um, so, you know, the, the, the assertion was made that something to the effect of like, well, you know, if, if it's not quantifiably measurable, then why are we doing it? Which of course seems absurd to me. And, you know, to, to any of us who are uh, sort of in these, in this, this kind of thinking, but how do you think, how do, how do we quantify, or I guess qualifies, you know, the better word, how, how do we measure when we talk about learning being effective? And I said, well, inquiry is something that, you know, is certainly more abstract and there's different ways to think about employing inquiry with students and students employing inquiry and all of that. But then there's also sort of a residual effect that that continues, I think, over years of it, that I think has got to be true with the enculturation process and the cultures of thinking. So um, I, I'm not sure there's really even a question there, but I'm just curious, I guess, in some sense of like how you all think about that, like, when we say we want our, our our schools to be effective and our work to be impactful with with students, it's got to be more than just those simple, you know, quantifiable, measurable. Oh, they know this, retained it, move on, that kind of thing. And so, what what do you, how do you respond when people ask those kinds of questions when we're working with them and 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 those kinds of things? Yeah, you know, well, just because something is measurable doesn't necessarily mean that it's important. <laughs> and, and we, you know, get so stuck in this idea, um, you know, of wanting to to measure. Um, you know, I, I did just come from Australia, and the um, the last school that I was working with there was a school that I'd worked with for ten years. Actually, it's a very very small. Um, it was originally a country school way on the, the outskirts of, um, of Melbourne. It's kind of grown now um, and, you know, expanded. And it's one of the um, most diverse um, ethnically schools that I've ever been at in Australia, mm-hmm. uh, which tends to have a very high Chinese population in terms of a, a different ethnicity than the, um, the Anglo population. But this school really had you east indian um had africans had um you know chinese had very you know um diverse and you could walk around the school and the principal gives um um uh, you know parents a, a tour of the school talks with the students and and it's just kind of palpable that this is you know a, a culture of thinking and i ask him about well how, how are your scores and he said well you know our scores aren't bad but they're not great you know they're not a, as good of course as we would like he said but when parents come here and they see me talking to a student and the student is able to articulate about their learning and they're able to say what how they're developing how they're growing why they like this this school the parents are blown away he said you know we have for parents who do come you know on a school tour he said you know we have about a a 98 enrollment rate from that because parents are blown away they look at this and say this is what i want for my child they mm-hmm. don't go and run and look at the league tables and say uh you know it is a school rate compared to you know another school and in fact you know um they've um you know had some students leave go to other schools and then kind of come back and say you know I, this is where i grow most as a learner um and it's really valuable so you know <laughs> That, that when people actually experience a culture of thinking and when they see what's happening, parents tend to say, yeah, that that is what I want. And again, it's not that the school is deliberately sacrificing uh, things um, academically. They're still you know, working on that. They're aware of, of the test, but they also know, yeah, at the end of the day, you know, we're developing people and and, you know, this this is an elementary school. They're they're also very aware, like, you know, if you 
turn kids off to school by sixth grade. They've <laughs> still an awful long time in school <laughs> to, to, to sit. And it, it's our responsibility to, to keep as many doors open for students to see themselves, you know, as, um, you know, successful. Um, you know, this it also happens to be a, an open plan school, no, no walls in the school. And you walk around and one of the school, one of the, the students that I talked to who had left and returned said, you know, I, I had to come back here because this school is calmer. Mm -hmm. She was at a school where she could sit in a, the other school. She could sit in, you know, four walls, door closed and theoretically be quiet. And she said, this school is calmer mm -hmm. because nobody yells. Nobody fights. Everybody respects one another. Everybody learns together. Every, you know, and she felt like uh, I, I can be, I can re be a really kind of focused, you know, learner here in this place. So, yeah. Well, it, cor it, it corrects me up to hear you say that because I've I've been told that the research shows and the evidence clearly shows that open classrooms do not work and the effect size is very small. All that. But, you know, and I'm sure that's true in many cases, right? There's lots of things that work and don't work, right? And, and you know, to me, that is one of the distinctions that seems to be unable to be made by so many. It's like, yes, this works, and but it doesn't always work, right? So direct explicit instruction doesn't always work and sometimes can be done poorly, open classrooms or inquiry, all of these things. So to... Uh, making that distinction and really thinking like how do we do it well if it's valuable if we value what what it's pointing to a desirable learning outcome right so uh if it's not it's if it's not even if it's done well if it's not going to get us the kinds of things that we value then of course don't do it but um, we don't seem to make those distinctions very often. So, well, I want to make sure that, um, you know, we're valuing Ron's time and I appreciate all that. We're as a little off ramp here as we're nearing the top of the hour. Susanna, you've been awful quiet over there. So I want to pull you out of your shell and say, you know, what, what else what do you want to add here? <laughs> well, is not, I have to tell you, like, I rarely take notes. I'm a, I'm a listener. I like to just really fully be present with people and listen and engage, but I have taken notes, you guys, because there's been just so many brilliant things said. So <laughs> that alone is like, wow, for me, um, I think being also an, an author of a book, Ron, and, and, um, working with a whole school to implement the the findings in the book and and seeing it come alive in real life is very exciting. And I I think I want to know from you in your work what you know as much as we write the book thinking these are the biggest takeaways that I I really want to see in a school. What ends up actually being the biggest takeaways from teachers and or students is very different. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious from your work what have you seen have been the things that people have really grabbed onto and run with and, and have really come alive from, from your book when you've been implementing it? Um, you know, one of the, well, one of, and kind of like the design of the book and, and um, the work around the book, I kind of have recognized and, and at the outset that people would move um, and focus on various mindsets. Um, based on where they are, based on where it seemed, you know, um, they are. And, you know, a, a mindset that I always see really in need of working on that I'm very glad that people tend to gravitate towards and pick up on and do is the idea that learning occurs at the point of challenge. Mm -hmm. um, that I find teachers tend to over scaffold, over structure things. Um, mm -hmm. I say that it, as teachers, um, it is actually very easy. And what we have the habit of doing is to create the illusion of learning, that, mm -hmm. that we've got a task, we want students to complete the task, and we wind up giving so many hints, so many suggestions, so much scaffolding, so much support, it's completed, and we're, we're pleased, and the <laughs> student is pleased, but there's been no learning there because we have created the illusion of learning. and. So I'm very pleased that people push into that, that kind of recognize uh, this is something I'm probably not doing very well. Um, and this is something where I want to grow. Um, and so that's that's been great that people have kind of seen um, that that's an area that they can kind of, you know, look at. And that, you know, 
part of that is that learning to um, not be unhelpful. Um, Jeffrey Chopin at um, UC Irvine did a research study that I reported um, in this particular chapter um, that when teachers um, were focused on students being correct, when students encountered a difficulty or a challenge, they again would over scaffold, they would over structure, they would um, simplify the task. But when teachers focused on thinking rather than correctness, then they leveraged the student's thinking to help the student move forward in the task. And thus that created more learning. So again, that importance of mindset of, of uh, we tend to be so focused in uh, the, the student isn't correct. They need to get this answer. The paper needs to look like this. And we work towards that. But when we work towards uh, what's the thinking the student's doing? How can I use their thinking? How can I help them um, to see that they have some, some thinking to pull forward here and that those teachers were actually more successful with their students in terms of the learning that they were doing because they became less focused on the, the kind of get it done correctness. I love that. I, we have a concept in flexible mindsets called productive puzzling. And that, mm. again, it's the same, the way that it is designed and set up is to how do we actually support students to to dig into that kind of thinking as opposed to always just exactly. looking for that one right answer and not realizing that there's there's so, again, teachers need support to be able to do it. And I, and I also, I love that the over scaffold is such, teachers wanna help, I say it all the time. And it is, it's in our nature. I mean, I was a teacher for many years and that's why I want I wanted to help. And it's so hard to withhold mm -hmm. that instinct so that students can be the ones to actually be building the neural pathways, not me. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Absolutely. That, that, go ahead, go ahead, Ron. Sorry. I, I my, Richard, were you gonna say something, Richard? Oh, I, I, this is lovely. I mean, what a lovely place to come to at the end of our time. Um, I think it. I think what we're saying, what I'm hearing you say here, is it's a different notion of what a teacher is. A teacher is not someone who goes and delivers a lesson. A teacher is someone who constructs learning engagements that allow kids to do that productive struggle and then supports where they need to. But it's a. It's a. It it front loads education, doesn't it? It, it? The work outside the classroom actually becomes fundamentally important to what happens inside the classroom. Oh, I'm curious because I'm because I'm having a, a bit of a back and forth about this productive struggle idea, which I, I'm I'm a fan of, right? And and I agree with you know we are generally over scaffolding, but I also it's it's not obvious to me always that that's necessarily true and i'm not saying that any of you are saying that that's always necessarily true but like when you think about a math classroom right where we do want to have in lots of cases right answers and um but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be building and thinking and and you know, doing some conceptual things so i'm curious ron how do you think about that in terms of a, especially foundational math and you know needing to, to actually know right answers and that kind of thing <laughs> well um you know, I mean, I, I was a mathematics teacher for a long time, and I think that people confuse the idea of arithmetic with mathematics. Um, and arithmetic is just the, the computational right answer things. The mathematics is understanding the relationships, being able to problem solve, being able to create mathematical models, much more kind of complex. And so when people say there's only one right answer, it's kind of like, well, if you're trying to model a situation, perhaps there's more than one mm -hmm. right answer there. And there's perhaps a more efficient, more elegant, and there's a lot more, again, complexity in that. And so focusing on the narrowness of arithmetic of that's all we want to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, all of the, you know, the advocates of, you know, direct instruction and and some of these, you know, <laughs> science of learning folks, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're often looking, I mean, a, a key driver for them is often efficiency. You know, how mm -hmm. do we get this efficiency? How do we yeah. get this? And so the yeah. idea that if I tell students exactly what I'm going to teach them and what we're going to learn and then give them a test immediately afterwards, well, yes, yeah. You know, but that's very, very short learn lived. Um, 
So in this idea, again, with the challenge, another you know researcher that I've been very influenced by is, is Robert Bjork at UCLA, um, who talks about desirable difficulties. Um, and that when the when the brain has to work a little bit harder, um, then then it makes the learning stick. So when we get that information, we have then in contrast to those desirable difficulties, we have what's called the fluency trap. And that is, ah, the teacher just delivered this great lecture. Everything made sense. So therefore, because I followed along, everything made sense. I must know it. And they don't. They walk out and it's actually easy to forget because the brain has done no processing of that information. Mm. And so in, when we have the direct instruction, we can create that illusion of learning by testing them right away. But Robert Bjork's work says, yeah, you know, three weeks later, a lot of, of the group um, that didn't struggle, actually their performance has gone way downhill. The group that struggled their performance, which was lower, granted at the beginning, their performance has gone up. So, you know, if we're looking at a long term, if we're looking at bigger pictures, if we're looking beyond this simple efficiency of I've got a test at the end of the day, I just want people to be able to give me the right answer on the test. I think that's an incredibly narrow view of what education is. Um, and so I think one of you know, everyone here, we're advocating this bigger picture of education. And I think we have to continue to be advocates, you know, yeah. for that. Uh, yeah. it, it might be the definition. Sorry, it might be the definition of education as we know it, but it's not the definition of learning. Yeah, right? education is definitely as we know it right now is test based and give me the right answer. But yeah, not, and I would even, you know I would even advocate that we need to like use a different word that, that what um, we're doing here is schooling rather than education. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the word narrow has shown up in my uh, Twitter X uh, replies quite often because it's like, why is this such a narrow set of outcomes that you're looking for? And of course, if that's the case, then what you're doing works great and the evidence shows that. But there's got to be more than that. And as I've said, you know, it's a uh, knowledge is necessary, but not sufficient. So. <laughs> Well, um, I want to honor your time, Ron. I, again, I appreciate, uh, always appreciate talking with you and the times you've been on the podcast and joining us here. Um, if, if you have any last words, feel free to to say those here, but otherwise we'll sign off and reconvene on another evening uh, tomorrow afternoon. If anybody's available, I've got uh, Alfie Cohn joining us for a, a brief time of talking about he's going to push back on cognitive load theory and and uh, direct instruction as only Alfie Cohn can do. So <laughs> yeah, well, I, I want to thank you all. Thank you, Drew. But great conversation. Thanks for all joining and thanks for your, your comments and your, your vast wealth of experience um, as well. So it's been a delight for me to be a part of this as well. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ron. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Next time. Nice to meet you all. Yes. Yes, indeed.